Okay, it looks like it's, it's about time to get started. Um, first of all, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see so, so many people can make it to my talk on the model view view model pattern. Um, how many of you guys uh, attended the previous talk by Tim Huckabee? Just a quick show of hands. So most of you people got a pretty good introduction to building applications, SAML-based applications using WPF. So the talk I'm going to give now is about the model view view model pattern, which is a design pattern you can apply uh, when you really kind of like start exploring SAML and want to build maintainable, testable applications. So this also ties back to some of the topics uh, Uncle Bob touched, up, touched on during the keynote about kind of like rootless testing, uh, decoupling, and kind of like some of those principles. Uh, my name is Jonas Follese. I work as a consultant at Capgemini. Uh, some of you, uh, I've been giving quite a few talks in Norway at user groups and MSCN Live. Uh, and some of you may have seen my uh, Dialog application, which has kind of like been my playground application for uh, exploring Silverlight applications, uh, Silverlight patterns. Um, and I also used this as a demo for MSCN Live earlier this year. So in this session, I'm going to build up on that application, pretty much take, uh, continue on from where we left off, off during MSCN Live and, and uh, extend it a little bit. So the topic today is, first of all, an introduction to the model view view model design pattern and uh, how it can help you build more maintainable, testable applications and why you should care about this. Uh, then I want to move on to a little bit more not really advanced, but some of the more tricky topics, like how do you combine the view model pattern with dependency injection? Um, and also, when building a full application, it's never enough with just one single pattern. You always have to kind of like combine uh, different patterns and different uh, designs to come up with, with a working solution. So I want to touch up on some of the supporting patterns you come across when implementing uh, a model view, view model application, uh, and more specifically, the commands uh, loosely coupled events through event aggregation and the service locator. And then by the end, we'll wrap up and open up for some Q&A. So uh, I've asked this before, but how many, is there any divers in the audience that do kind of like scuba diving on holidays, like five, six? Um, so when you do diving, you typically use uh, a dive log to keep track of your experience. So you write down where you went diving, how deep did you go, how long did you spend underwater, uh, and all kind of stuff like that. If you've got a dive computer, you can typically log this information directly on your dive computer and then synchronize it to your computer. So I decided to use this as kind of like the demo concept for, for this talk. Uh, in my second talk later today, I'll use fishing, fly fishing as the topic, which is my other big hobby. So I kind of like always try to bring in hobbies into the demos instead of going for the HR applications and the payroll systems. So Kind of before we get started, I just want to show you the application because this talk is going to be a bit of demo, but a fair, quite a quite a bit of conceptual stuff in in slides. So I just want to run. Oh, it's just studio hang. That's a great start. Well, I'll try just to run the application to give you a quick overview of what it looks like and what it does. And I couldn't help myself. I know this is going to be more about the patterns, but since this is Silva Tree, I just could not help myself adding some spinning, moving, animating stuff, since after all, it is Silva Light. So this is the dive log application. We got all the log dives on the left-hand side. You can select them. Nothing happens, so we're going to add that until we navigate to the second view. So this is kind of like I've decomposed the application a little bit. So we got one view, which is uh, dive selection on the left-hand side. We got another view, which is the main area where we do edit of the dives. And then we got the second view, which is the home page. So you can pick a view, click edit, change how much air did we have in the tank when we entered the water, what was the visibility like, what kind of weather conditions did we have, things like that. And then we can uh, save it back to the server. So this is the application we're going to kind of like uh, dissect a little bit. We're going to look behind how is this built and how do the different parts communicate between one another and, and how, how is the model view, view model pattern applied to this app. So we'll come back to that one and look a little bit more into the code. So the reason why we want to 
explore patterns like the view model pattern. Uh, it's kind of like come up with, we want to, when writing applications, it's easy to get, in, to get tempted to put everything in the code behind. When you start a new ASP.NET web application, you get your ASPX file, you get your code behind file. Or if you start a new WPF app, you get your SAML file and your code behind. And it's quite easy to kind of like just chug along, add code to the click event handlers and then the code behind. Uh, and the problem is quite easily you end up building business logic into your user interface. And the problem with this is you're not separating your concerns, right? You're mixing the concern of enforcing business rules with the concern of displaying a user interface. And I'm sure everyone has kind of like run into this problem that after some time your application becomes really hard to maintain because there's just so much stuff going on in the UI. And it's also really hard to unit test it because you cannot just new up a, a page and just run it independently because there's so much user interaction required to kind of like simulate a user clicking. Uh, so instead, we, we want to try to separate things out so that we don't end up uh, with just a bunch of spaghetti code and a team of sad coders and designers. Um, because in WPF and Silverlight, designers is another important role. Even though you may not have a dedicated designer on your team, you sh you, you're definitely going to have someone who feels responsible for the UI of the application. And when building out the app, we should think about what kind of patterns can be applied to make their job uh, a little bit easier. So instead of a bunch of spaghetti, we want to kind of try to layer things a little bit nicely, uh, separate out the UI from the state and the behavior of the application so that we can test it independently. So we pretty much want to go from spaghetti to lasagna, which in, in my honest opinion is, is also a lot better as, as a food. So when we decide that, OK, we're not going to stuck everything in the code behind. We need to come up with some better way to design this application. So we go online, and we start, sh start Googling. And, and we want to see what people smarter than ourselves uh, is doing to solve this issue. So we, we find articles and journals and books written by people like Uncle Bob and Martin Fowler or Jeremy Miller, some of those really talented guys. And they talk about things like MVC, MVP, MVVM. Uh, and we end up feeling a little bit like this puffer fish, like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> what's the difference between all these UI patterns? Which one do, you have, which one do I pick? And what's, what's the right solution for this kind of, of UI platform? But if you set, uh, and part of the reason for this confusion, I think Martin Fowler uh, kind of like nails in his UI architecture essay, where he say that people read about MVC in different places and take different IDs and call these MVC. And MVC is one of those old, the model view, uh, model view controller pattern, it's one of those old classic patterns dating all the way back to, I think, small talk in the 70s. Um, and back then, the UI technologies and the platforms we used to build applications was completely different than what we got today. Uh, but the patterns have kind of like evolved over time, and people are calling it MVC while it's actually quite different. So uh, if, it's, if we kind of like step back a little bit and look at what we really want to solve, uh, and that's separation of concern. We want to separate out the presentation of the application from the behavior, the state, and the logic. Uh, and this family of patterns is called separated presentation patterns. So all these kind of like MVC, view model, presentation model, model view presenter, all of these patterns belong to this separated presentation patterns family. And the thing they try to separate is uh, data and domain logic. And that's often referred to as your model. So most of these patterns have some kind of model. And that's your business entities, your domain objects. Uh, it could be your web services, web service references. So every, anything you use to get your objects or your data structures you, you're going to work on. And then you've got a U, uh, UI or a view. So you need some way to kind of like display the data, uh, either directly or perhaps you want to shape your, your customer object a little bit before displaying it. So you need some kind of UI. And the thing that is different between all these patterns is this third guy, the interaction, like the guy that glues the view to the model, the one that takes the UI concepts and glues it to your domain objects. And if you're using ASP.NET, the MVC pattern might be a good fit with the stateless nature and the request response nature of the web and with the request coming in, landing at the controller, then making a decision of what kind of logic we want to apply. But when working with a platform like WPF or Civilite, where everything is stateful, running on the client, um, and we've got long-lived objects, there might be other patterns that are more suited. Uh, and one of these patterns that has gotten quite popular in the WPF and, and Silverlight space, uh, and I'm kind of like not differentiating too much between WPF and Silverlight because they've got so much in common, 
uh, is a pattern Martin Fowler refers to as a presentation model, and he described it back in July 2004. And, and the essence of the presentation model is basically a self-contained class that represents the data and the behavior of your UI, but without any of the UI controls used to render it. Um, then the UI simply projects the state of the presentation model directly onto the glass. So that's kind of like the core essence of uh, presentation model. So it's just another object, not your business or domain object, another object that is tailor fit to be used by the view, but it doesn't contain any controls. Uh, and then Foley goes on to say that the most annoying part of presentation model is the synchronization between presentation model and view. Like, how do you keep the, U, uh, the view in sync with the view model? So you might have cases like with a lot of left to right programming. You have a person object with a name property, and they've got a text box called txt name. And then you go like name equals txt name dot text, h equals convert to int. And you do all this kind of like gluing um, to glue the view to your uh, presentation model. And then he says that ideally some kind of framework should handle this. And he's hoping that one day uh, technologies like .NET Data Binding can solve this. And this was written back in 2004, like before WPF was released, before Silverlight. And kind of like, um, thankfully for Martin Fowler, this day has come with WPF and Silverlight. We can use data binding to get rid of all this left to right coding and just use data binding uh, to bind against uh, our objects. And uh, uh, you might wonder, like, what's the difference between presentation model and view model? It's the exact same thing, but the view model is in a WPF Silverlight context. So another guy on the Microsoft WPF team came up with the term view model around 2005 uh, without r really kind of thinking it through that it's actually the same thing as, as uh, the presentation model. And the term kind of like sort of stuck, uh, which I guess is fair enough, because when you go on Google, if you search for uh, MVVM or view model, you'll find a lot of hits relating to this pattern implemented in a WPF or Silverlight context. While if you search for presentation model, you get kind of like more generic uh, hits. Uh, but kind of like to get rid of the confusion, it's, it's the same thing. So this is a model that uh, you might be used to. You have a view, um, which uh, in WPF and Silverlight consists of a SAML file and a code behind file. So kind of like just off the bat, you're forced to have at least some kind of separation between your logic sitting behind the view and uh, the SAML representing the view. Um, if you're using ASP.NET, you have an ASPX file, and then you have a code behind file. And then using um, code behind event handlers, you typically talk to your data model. And the problem is, like I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to uh, test and mock and kind of like uh, work on the code behind file independently. So it becomes hard to, to use uh, test-driven design to build it out, for instance. So with the model view, view model, we still got a view using SAML on the top, but we try to slim down the code behind uh, to as little as possible. We, we want to have an absolute minimum uh, of, of code living in the code behind file. Then we add this new concept, which is the view model. And the view model represents the state and the operations of the, view, uh, of the UI. So if you have uh, an orders form, you might have an orders view model, which has all the properties you want to data bind against. Um, and you might have a command to, do, uh, to invoke operations like save customer or delete customer. Uh, so instead of having a code behind event handler calling that operation, you use a command and you data bind the command against the view model. So you use data binding and commands to connect the view and the view model. The view model uh, notifies the view of any changes through change notification. So by implementing this uh, I notify property change interface, you can tell the user interface that some property change you need to go and update yourself. And that's what, what eliminates the need for writing all this kind of like synchronization code, because we can just use a binding expression and say, I want to bind this UI element against this property on the view model. And the view model is also the one responsible for turning your view model into a real uh, domain objects or business entity objects. So if you have a customer view model tailor fit to be used by the view, uh, the view model is responsible for then updating the customer and then calling the web service to persist it back on the server. And, and by having the view model as a kind of like standalone independent class, you can, can test it in isolation using a mock service, for instance, to test the interaction between your view model and, and the data model. 
So to use data binding, you implement the iNotify property change interface uh, on your object or on your view model. And then for any collection, like a list of products or a list of customers or a list of dives, you use an observable collection of T. So an observable collection is a collection class that raises events whenever an item is added, removed, uh, or removed from the list. So that if you bind, say, a list box to an observable collection and you add an item to the collection, you don't have to go and update the list box. The UI automatically updates itself when you make that change. So on the UI in the SAML file, you'll, you could have, say, a list box, and you say, I want to bind this list box. I want the items in this, in this list box to be bound to the dives property of uh, the view model. And I want to have the selected item. So whenever we select something in the list box on the left, I want to have that data bound against the selected dive. So that's what we got up in the view. Then in a separate class, we have the view model, which is called, say, dive view model, which implements the iNotify property changed, which is basically just a single event called uh, property changed event. And then we have an observable collection of dives, and then we have a dive property. So this is kind of like a class without any UI constructs. It's just a plain C-sharp class exposing the things the UI needs. Uh, so we're going to jump back to the application and try to add a little bit of functionality to to the app. So the first thing we want to add in is, let's bring it up again to kind of like explain a little bit. I want to add a new uh, page up here that is called depth profile. So when you use a dive computer, uh, when you go diving, it takes a sample of your depth every 30 seconds. So it records what's your current uh, depth level. And then when you get back to the computer, you can uh, download the data to your computer and you can kind of like see a graph showing like, the depth throughout your dive and you can make sure that you have like an even dive profile. You should always go deep to begin with and then go gradually shallower and then you need to have the safety stop towards the end. So you can use a depth profile to look on that. Um, so to add that, I'll need to start by adding a new view up my visual studio okay there it is so we need to add uh, a new view and a new view model so we stop adding the view so just add a civil app page and call it uh, say depth profile view and at the same time uh, I'll add the view model. So if this wasn't a demo, I'll typically use test-driven development and start by developing the view model using TDD. Uh, so let's call this depth profile view model. So I'm using this kind of like naming pattern. All the views end with view, and the supporting view model ends with view model. And then I'll just derive from base view model, and this is just a simple class I created that implements iNotify property changed, got the event, and a method to erase the event handler. So let's add in a constructor. And we want to expose, so when we got a depth profile, we want to expose kind of like a, an observable collection of all the different samples, so the depth samples, with uh, what time the sample is taken, so in minutes, so two minutes into the dive, your current depth was three meters. Five minutes into your dive, your depth was eight, meet, uh, eight meters. So I'm just going to include um, a property, which is uh, an observable collection of depth sample objects. And this observable collection uh, property got, uses this uh, property change pattern. So whenever the property is changed, I call race property changed. Um, have any of you guys, just a quick show of hands, how, how many of you have played with the view model pattern before and implemented another? Quite a few of you. Uh, so uh, then you know kind of a little bit of the pain of implementing this pattern because you have to pass strings in as the argument to tell which property did change. And most developers kind of like get this sense of code smell when you need to pass magic strings along. So finding the perfect implementation of iNotify property change is almost becoming like the holy grail of Civilite and WPF developers. And, and the solution I like the best is a combination of having this base class, which takes the property name as a string because that's what the property change event args takes. But at the same time, I've got an extension method that takes in 
the view model and a property uh, as a lambda expression, and then it uses reflection to get the property name and then invoke uh, uh, invoke the property changed event. And the benefit is that if I want to raise the property changed event like this, let's say, I can just pass in, and then I can pick which property I want to notify a change of. And the benefit, of course, is that uh, if I refactor this code and change the property name, this is something uh, Uncle Bob talked about, kind of like you should constantly changing your code, making it better. So if I change, say, the property to be called depth uh, values instead of depth samples, uh, if I use the string, I had to remember to go and change the string. But since I'm using this reflection base, this property would change, and I wouldn't have to change any of my code. So just a little bit of a tip. I'll put put all this code up on my blog if, if anyone's interesting after the conference. Anyway, um, to begin with, we're just going to use mock data. Just going to generate some data to get something up and running on the view. So I got a little bit of a, a sample method that takes, uses some random numbers, takes in a depth and a bottom time, and tries to generate a, like a s somewhat realistic depth profile that a diver typically would have. Just new up the collection and call generate sa generate sample date dive. So now the view model is ready. I haven't done anything that is specific to the user interface yet. So I just prepared all the data we need to uh, to show in the UI. So let's go to the page. Can get rid of this event handler. So this is the user interface part. This is the SAML uh, file with the code behind. And currently, there's no code in the code behind, and we're going to kind of keep it that way. So instead, uh, we're going to start by including a couple of namespaces. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So I'm going to use uh, the Civil Toolkit charting components to visualize the depth profile. And then I need to include the view model namespace. And what I can do then is just go navigation uh, page, which is the current page, and set the data context of this page to be uh, view models, that profile view model. And I'm just going to copy in uh, a bit of SAML that's using the charting toolkit. And it binds against using data binding. It binds the item source against the depth samples. And it binds the dependent value against the depth property and the independent value against the minute property on the depth sample object. So final thing is that we need a way to show this on the main page. So I got this shell SAML. The shell is kind of like sitting around the application, hosting the logo and the navigation on the top. Uh, and I'm using the new navigation framework in Silverlight 3 to navigate between pages. So I just start by saying that the source should be the home view page. And then I'm going to add in uh, a new navigation button. And I set the tag to be kind of like whatever view I want to navigate to. Um, in the click event handler, we'll try to get rid of this guy later on. But I simply call mainframe navigate. So let's try and run it. So when I click Depth Profile, I'll get a Depth Profile, uh, which is basically all the uh, generated example data showing that at, after five minutes, I was down at 24 meters, and I went up and down a little bit. After 50 minutes, I went back up to eight, did some diving, and then I had my safety stop and went up. So this is just sample data. And nothing happens when I navigate between the dives on the left-hand side. Uh, so we're going to implement that uh, as kind of like the next step. But now we've got a basic view uh, with a view model, model tied up. So let's <coughs> jump back to the slides. So uh, another quote I wanted to include is from Josh, uh, Josh Smith from his WP Apps app with a model view, view model, model design pat pattern article from MSDN Magazine. And the thing Josh says is that once a developer becomes familiar, uh, comfortable with WPF and view model, it can be difficult to differentiate the two. And the model view, view model is the lingua franca of WPF developer because it's well suited for, uh, to use by WPF. And WPF was designed to make it easy to build application using this pattern. Uh, and this is, by the way, pretty much how the kind of pattern came about is 
uh, expression blend, which is the design, design tool for WPF and Silverlight, is all built using this pattern. So because Silverlight and WPF depend so heavily on data binding, it feels really natural building up these objects that you can bind with that follow this uh, kind of like I notify property change using observable collection so that you can simply bind uh, and not having to, to use any uh, code behind code. So what about user interaction? Uh, so far, I showed you how we can switch between views using that click event handler and then navigate to a specific SAML page. Uh, an application might have many points of user interaction. For instance, the dialogue, I need to be able to save the changes to back to the server. I need to add a new item. I need to be able to delete the dive. So there's a bunch of user interaction. Um, and the most kind of like straightforward way would be to just knock in uh, an event handler and then call the operation on the view model. Uh, and, and this is problematic for, for a couple of reasons. First off, it would be hard to test that the view does the correct thing when some kind of action is taken. Right? It's hard to simulate button save click uh, as a unit test. Uh, second problem is that uh, a user interface designer may not want to use a specific button as the method of invoking an operation. The designer may want to go and say, well, I don't want to use a button to save the dive. So I want to, if when I click this, turtle or this dolphin video, I want to save the dive. So it's different ways of invoking the same operation. And if we have event handlers all over the code invoking operations, uh, we, we tie the UI uh, to the code behind file, and it makes it harder for the designers to come in and say, I want to replace this button with a video, or I want to replace this button with a checkbox or something else that invokes the command. So you want to try to separate things out a little bit. The second kind of reason why we want to be a little bit careful with code behinds and having too much stuff in the event handlers is <coughs> that most applications have many ways to invoke the same operation. So Microsoft Word uh, lets you save a document by hitting Control S, uh, hitting the Save uh, tiny icon, or hitting the big Save icon. And that's three different user interactions to invoke the same method, I'm sorry, the same operation, like saving a document. Uh, and if we had code behind uh, event handlers, we, we would have to go into each one of those, update the code uh, that tells, that, that kind of like implements what's going to happen when you, save the when you save a document. So instead, we try to use this pattern called commands. And commands is all about using objects to represent action. And a command encapsulates an action and the parameters so that you can decouple the invoker of the command and the handler of the command. So what I'm basically saying is that you can decouple the view model that is going to handle the command from the view that is going to invoke it. Uh, and in Silverlight and WPF, this pattern is basically defined by a simple interface called iCommand um, that exists in both WPF and Silverlight that you can implement um, to create a command. But uh, in WPF, you've got command binding built in. But in Silverlight, they haven't included that yet. So you need to use uh, some attached behaviors to say, bind this button against uh, the delete command. Um, so instead of having a click event handler, we add in a binding to say, I want to bind against a command on the view model. And then on the view model, again, completely independent of the view, uh, you got a new property called uh, delete command, which is of type i command. Um, and in this particular example, I'm using delegate command, which is a way to kind of like delegate the inv invocation of the command to a method on the view model. Um, so when the delete command is, is executed, the delete dive method of the view model is executed. And the cool thing is that I can unit test this view model. And if I want to test that the correct behavior is taken when you want to delete something, I could just call delete command dot execute. And then I can do all my assertions and my, my tests to verify that I did actually remove it from the list. And I did actually set uh, the status flag to be deleted, for instance. So you can kind of like verify that the correct action is taken. So let's jump back and have a little bit, have a quick look on how commands are implemented. So <coughs> the shell, which is the kind of guy hosting the navigation, got buttons to do the navigation. And this can be problematic for a couple of reasons. Like I mentioned earlier, it makes it harder for designer designers, but it also makes it a little bit tougher for to unit test kind of like uh, what should happen when you navigate away from a UI. Like there's no way to hook in and write code that that executes before uh, navigation. So I want to get navigation away from the UI uh, and into a view model. So what I do is 
uh, I simply say commands, click, command, binding, path, and then I bind it against a command. Navigate command, and the navigate command is hanging off uh, the shell view model. So again, the shell got its own view model, and this guy got three commands. It got a submit command, a new command, and a navigate command, all exposed as properties. And in the uh, navigate command, I say, well, I want to use the delegate command to implement this command, and I want to call the navigate function. So when we call navigate, I'll set a breakpoint. We'll get a string as a command parameter, and we'll try to update the selected page. And the selected page is basically a URI URI object that we can data bind against. So we update the selected page from the view model, and this could be completely unit tested. So back up in the shell, we need to also set the, the command parameter. And we're going to use com uh, the command parameter to be the view we want to navigate to. So I'll just quickly do this for all of the views, remove it. And we want to set the command parameter. And then we can go in the code behind and we can get rid of this code because we no longer need the click event handler. Um, and if we run the application, it should be here pretty much the same way as previously, but we move navigation away from uh, code behind and into the view model. So when I click dive details, the navigate method on the view model executes, uh, and I can see that it's the correct string, and then I can take action to navigate away. And I actually did forget one thing. So I Nothing happened because I haven't data bound uh, the source of the navigation frame against the selected page property of the view model. So I need to quickly go back and say that instead of having this as a string, I want to data bind it against the selected page property of the shell view model. And now if I run it, I can navigate between the different pages. So you can like move the way that code that used to be a direct call to frame.navigate uh, in the code behind file into the view model where it can be tested and um, independently. So that was commands. So what about dependencies? So I didn't show, I've got to show it, but the um, the shell view model is the class responsible for loading the data from the web service. And the view model is coupled with the web service implementation because it creates kind of like the, the web service proxy in the, code in the constructor. And that makes the code less flexible for change because if you want to change, say, the, the, what service we're using to get the data, uh, we have to go in and change the view model. We cannot just say, I want to use this service instead. And it also makes the ho code harder to test. So if you want to test, that the view model behaves correctly, we may not want to call the web service every time from a unit test. We want to just use some kind of mock to mock out uh, the service dependency so that we can simulate the same data coming back every time. And then we can verify that the view model does the correct thing when it gets data from the service. Um, so objects shouldn't be responsible for creating their own dependencies, so their own external dependencies. So we try to apply the inversion of control principle. Um, and dependency injection is one way of uh, implementing inversion of control. And the idea is that any dependency uh, the object has is created outside the object and injected into them, either as a constructor parameter or as a property. Just a quick show of hands, how many have kind of like used dependency injection and, and stuff like that before? About 15% roughly. So the way it looks is that instead of having the, the service created inside the constructor of the page view model or the shell view model, I say, I want to take this as an external dependency pass into the constructor. And then the question becomes like, who creates the, de but who creates the dependency and injects it? You could do it by hand. The code behind file could say that, for instance, in this case, um, I want to check whether or not the code is being uh, used in Blend. And if it's used in Blend, I use a stub service so that the designer gets some example data in Blend. But if we're running uh, the real application inside the browser, I want to use a real web service. So I create it and set the data context. Uh, so I'm kind of like injecting the implementation of the service uh, in the constructor. 
but then you can ask yourself, like, should the page be responsible for creating the dependency? Is this really part of the UI code? So to solve this, we typically use IOC containers where we define dependencies as constructor parameters, and then we could have some kind of uh, container and just say, well, I just want to get an instance of the page view model, and you go figure out what to pass into the constructor. So that's kind of like the idea behind our C containers. And I'm sure uh, that would deserve its own talk, uh, just going into the details. But roughly, you kind of like configure up all the dependencies, and then you say, I just want to get an instance of the page view model and add any external dependency needed. Which brings us to kind of like another question of, of you often run into when doing uh, model view view model is, what comes first, the view or the view model? Like who should instantiate who, and who should, like how should we do that? And there's basically two options. You could either do view model first, and when you do view model first, you uh, the view model uh, creates the view, usually through an IOC container. So you typically have a view model taking in some kind of view interface in the constructor, and then the view model connects itself to the view. The drawback of this uh, doing it this way is first off the, the view model has to know about the view hold, holds a direct reference to the view second problem is there is no view at design time right because this code the injection code would only happen when running the application so if you want to set uh, some kind of data context declaratively on the view so that to get design time data we need to use the view first uh, alternative and that way the view uh, has a relationship to the uh, view model, and this usually happens through data binding. And, and that's the exact thing we did with the depth profile view. So we set the data context declaratively uh, to be an instance of the depth profile view model. Remember on the top of the, of the page? And the benefit is, first off, the view model is available at design time. So when the SAML file is being consumed by Blend, the view model is available, and the designer can set up all the bindings, and it can get example data showing in blend data that is populated into list views. But the challenge is, like, how do we use combine IOC with view-first implementations? Because you can only create an instance declaratively if it has a parameterless constructor. So how do you, like, how do you combine these two? Um, and that's the next thing I want to kind of quickly show. So. In the previous example, um, the depth profile view model was created directly by the depth profile view uh, by creating a new instance uh, declaratively by just newing up, not sorry, but just typing in depth profile view model. But what if we had an external dependency like an event aggregator? And I'll get back to that a bit uh, later. But let's say we have some kind of external dependency. like this, and we try to run the code. And I try to navigate to that profile and get an exception saying that there's no parameterless constructor for this type. So we get a runtime exception saying that we cannot create uh, an instance of the depth, uh, depth profile view model. So what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to use an IOC container. And I've, in this case, I'm using Unity. There's a bunch of other containers available. I've previously used an inject. And the way you do it is you pretty much just say, I want to register um, the I event aggregator interface against the concrete implementation event aggregator. And then you just register all your types. And uh, so let's just container register type depth profile view model. So whenever I want to get a new instance of the depth profile, I'll just call uh, resolve depth profile view model. And the IOC container will uh, notice that, well, to create a depth profile view model, I also need to create an I event aggregator. And since we already got I event aggregator registered, it will first create this guy, pass it into the constructor of that guy, and then return a new instance of that object. So you can like we centralize the construction of the application of all the objects into one single place. Um, but how do we kind of get it out of the IOC container and then bound up to the view using the view first mechanism? And to do that, we use a service locator uh, exposing a single property for each view model. Like 
like this. Sometimes when you're reading blogs and stuff, this is sometimes referred to as a uh, view model locator, uh, but it's basically an implementation of the service locator pattern, which is about having one class where you can get instances of all your type. So just call resolve, depth profile view model, set a property. And this is just a plain C sharp class using the uh, Unity container and then calling resolve every time you need to get a new depth profile view model. Next thing I've done is to add the service locator as an application resource in the app.saml with the key service locator. So when the application starts, we create one new instance of the service locator that will be available throughout the lifetime of this app. So up in the depth profile view, I can just say, well, instead of creating it directly, I just I want to use again data binding. I want to bind against the uh, depth profile profile view model. And I want the source to be a static resource called service locator. So I'm binding against the depth profile view model property of the service locator object living inside the application resource. So when I run this app, and remember I put a break breakpoint on the service locator to kind of like show you what's happening. So when I click this guy, it's going to data bind against the service locator and it's going to look for the depth profile view model. Uh, Let's see if I can real quick add another cons uh, another breakpoint. Uh, so when I run this code, it's going to call resolve the depth profile view model, which is going to instantiate a new instance of the depth profile view model and pass in an instance of the EI event aggregator as the first parameter. So I don't have to worry about any of that. And when the application runs, I get the same UI back but the view model is created using an IOC container exposed through a service locator. So that's how you, you do view first against view models that uses dependency injection. So now that we got um, the depth, pro depth profile up and running, uh, but currently it's only showing sample data and nothing happens when I select something on the left-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we had that list view, right? The list view is a separate view with a separate view model. And then we have the edit page, which is another view with another view model. And then we have the depth profile, which is another view with another view model. And somehow we need to have these guys communicating. And well, we could just start injecting them into one another and then expose an event saying that a uh, dive selected event on the uh, dive list box and then the um, dive list box view model and then the depth profile view model could just listen to that event. And all of a sudden we've just move back to spaghetti land because we have so many dependencies going between the view models that it's really hard to change one view, view model without changing all the others. Uh, so instead, well, and this again comes back to kind of like this principle of coupling or uh, perhaps more importantly, how to decouple your components so that they can be developed, tested, and maintained independently of one another. Uh, there's this kind of like returning topic of object-oriented design and, and development. So instead of having all the view models uh, referencing one another, creating tight coupling between the view models, we put in uh, kind of like a man in the middle. Um, uh, and, in many, and one way you can do it is using an event aggregator, which is almost like a, a mini service bus, a message bus for your application. So you can pass, you can say, well, I would just want to expose the message. I just selected a dive. And then anyone who cares can listen to it. So the way it could work is you have, on the left-hand side, you have, um, the dive list view model, which expose, publishes a message that, hey, a new dive was just selected. It knows nothing about the other view models and the other views that might care about this message, but they've registered at the event aggregator and saying, well, I, I care if there's a dive selected message coming in. So the event aggregator knows that it needs to publish that message to um, the depth profile view and the dive edit view. But and we've done this without coupling the select dive and the edit dive and the depth profile views. So they completely decouple. And this is often called an event aggregator, a published subscribe event uh, service, or sometimes the mediator pattern is the same thing. It's kind of like whenever you have classes, objects that needs to work together, but you don't want to couple them, you can use kind of like a man in the middle and, and communicate through him. So let's uh, go back and try to complete the UI or complete the demo. 
So the next thing we want to do is, uh, hmm? okay, bit change just change to my, okay. Let's see if we, okay, now we got sound again. Is it sound level okay? Good. A little bit loud down here, perhaps. Better now. Okay, so uh, we're going to have, uh, see how we can use the event aggregator to update the depth profile view whenever a dive is selected on the left-hand side. Um, the first thing you do is you typically define the messages you want to exchange between the objects or between your, your classes. So I got a message called dive selected message. Uh, and in this case, I'm using the event aggregator that is implemented as part of Prism, uh, Prism 2. There's a bunch of others you could use. It's quite easy to write, write one yourself. But for this demo, I'm using the Prism implementation. So I can just derive from composite presentation event and say that the payload of this message is going to be an instance of a dive view model. So one, in one single dive from the list box is going to be uh, the payload of this message. And then up in the dives list view, I have a property called selected dive. And every, every time the selected dive property is set, uh, I'll call message bus get event. And then I say, I want to get the event uh, for the dive selected message. And then I want to publish it. And then I just pass in the selected view model. So I don't care if anyone is listening. I just want to publish that a new dive was just selected in the left hand side. Then in the edit dive view model, which is a view model for the central UI piece, uh, I want to know whenever a dive is selected so that I can load it up and data bind the UI. So I'm, I'm calling message bus get event dive selected message. And then I call subscribe, saying that any time a new message arrives for this message type, I want to call the load dive method. And the load dive simply says, well, the current dive is the one that is selected. So in order to do the same thing for the depth profile, First thing, we're not going to use the sample data anymore. Instead, I'm going to create a new method called dive selected. That takes in the selected dive as the parameter. Depth samples equals dive samples. So I pick the sample object of the dive and then use that for the view model. And then finally, I need to call message bus, get event messages, dive selected message. Subscribe, and then I'm going to call dive selected, like that. So if I add a breakpoint at this point, and then the selected, and try and run the application, we should now be able to kind of like select something on the left-hand side in a completely decoupled, independent view, but at the same time, no on the right-hand side. So I'll click the profile. And when I click, for instance, this dive, uh, which was 40 meters, 45 minutes, the selected dive property of the view model changes. I get the event, call publish. And the moment I call publish, through the event aggregator, the message flows into the depth profile view model, which can then take the samples hanging off uh, the dive object and display in the UI. So I'll just disable some of these breakpoints, see if we can. So whenever we change, change the selection on the left-hand side, without having to do anything with the existing view to notify this depth profile view that something happened, and we could just publish a message and then start listening to it. And save on this guy, whenever I select it, the selected view changes. So that's kind of like how you can have decoupled views communicating with one another through this shared uh, event aggregator or mediator or 
whatever implementation you want to use. So kind of like to summarize a little bit, uh, kind of like the core concepts of the view model is, first of all, try and put all your state and all your behavior into the view model where it can be tested, where you can invoke a command and then do assertions to verify that the state updated correctly or the correct services were called. Uh, second, every time you want to invoke an operation on the view model, you do that through commands. Um, if you need to communicate between views and view models, you do that through some kind of man-in-the-middle solution, typically using a mediator or an event aggregator, like I, I showed in this demo. And then the kind of like fourth tip is, if you're using view first design and you want to bind against view models that needs to use dependency injection, uh, locate, put all your view models behind a service uh, locator, put the service locator as an application resource, and then you can start binding against it. And kind of like the two things I want you to remember is that applying view model or other UI patterns is all about separating presentation logic, application logic away from the view used to render it. And by doing that, we can decouple the pieces of the application so that they can be tested and developed independently. And with that, I just want to Thank you for your attention and open up for questions. Thanks. So, I'm not sure if there's a microphone or if you just need to kind of like ask out loud. Uh, and if, if you don't want to ask the question kind of like publicly, I'll be hanging around here till the next speaker shows up so you can also come down to the stage if you have any questions. Uh, a little bit hard to see the lights. No, not too many. Hopefully everything is, is all clear then. So <laughs> thank you and see you later today.